Stories of Futures Past presents two dark and disturbing vintage science fiction stories. My Robot by Henry Slezar A Kiss for the Conqueror by Clyde Mitchell which is a shared pseudonym. We don't really know who wrote it. These dark stories deal with serious themes such as assault and abuse in their 1957 literary way. They are supposed to make the reader uncomfortable and also think. Discretion is advised. My Robot by Henry Slezar Writing as O. H. Leslie Originally published in Fantastic, February 1957 Narrated by Tom Trussell How I wish 4-4 four four were here! What a joy to be a child again, and sit once more in his strong wide lap, and rest my fevered cheek against the cool metal surface of his chest, and let my sticky, stumpy fingers play idly over the buttons of his back, and finally press down the one that brought forth his soothing, smoothing, story-telling voice. There was once a shoemaker who through no fault of his own had become so poor that at last he had only leather enough for one pair of shoes. Oh, four-four, what have they done with you? Memory, memory, so sweet, so painful. What was the rhyme that father taught me? The rhyme that told me how four-four worked. Information, registration, consideration, Memory, calculation, conversation, robots made by Emery, my father. A big man, a brilliant man, and I was an Emery too. And when I grew up, great things were expected of me. For didn't I have four four? What child could cope for a better tutor? Information, registration, consideration, memory. Oh, four, four, how could I have ever hated your cold, cruel chest, your icy arms, your frozen mechanical affection? How could I have struck your brain housing with such fury, beating the heavy hammer in great gong, gong, gongs? Yes, father, I deserved your punishment. You were right. I was wrong. Again, again, only beat me again. How could I feel such gross ingratitude again? My mother... He's only a child, shrieking at him. He's only seven. How soon his red anger died. Remorse, regret, eyes staring in bewilderment at the thick brown strap in his hand. He could have destroyed him, he said, in a voice I didn't know. He could have smashed the work of a lifetime. Forty-four experiments, twelve years, and he could have... Oh, father, how I wronged you! Again, again! But how soon I learned! Cold steel or warm flesh, how little the difference really mattered! My mother's sleepy time kiss, once so sweet and comforting! My father's gruff hair rumpling, how trivial these childhood pleasures seemed! after the lessons of four-four, the strength of four-four, the quick thrilling response of four-four to every childish command. Oh, four-four, how well I learned your ways! Information, registration, consideration, memory. A whole year, I said, 
maybe a little less, said my mother. It's a very important assignment, said my father. A great honour, said my mother, stroking my hair, as if to comfort me. It's a government project, and very secret. Can you understand that? Your mother and I will be living in very cramped quarters and leading greatly restricted lives. There won't be any playgrounds, or children your own age, or anything. And besides, said my mother, was that a tear on her face? You'll have Aunt Hulda and Forfor, of course. You'll be all right, said my father, as if he really knew. Was I happy? Was I sad? Forfor, do you remember? What did I say to you that night in the aloneness of my room? Did I cry? On the lap, head against the chest, press the button, drowsy listening, soothing, smoothing, story-telling voice. Now the Queen, having eaten Snow White's heart, as she supposed, felt quite sure that now she was the first and fairest, and so she came to her mirror and said, Information, registration, consideration, memory. Say that again. You heard me. I dare you to say it again. You're an orphan. I heard my mother say so. You ain't got no father. You're a liar. Who's a liar? Who's a liar? I'll show you who's a liar. A scuffle in the sand. A hard ball of fingers on my nose. Blood on my shirt. Yelling, screaming, crying. I'm not an orphan. I'm not. I'll learn you who's a liar. I'll show you little snot no stupid orphan. Hot tears. Shameless. Screaming. Screaming. Four, 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 four. Pounding on my ribs. Then, holy Christmas, holy. Revenge, four, four. Revenge. Ma, ma. Hold him, four, four. Punch him, four, four. Bloody nose, four, four. Bloodier than mine. Revenge. Revenge, four, four. Revenge. Information. Registration. Consideration. Memory. Oh, he's been a good boy, Mr. Emery, said Aunt Hulda. But he broke the nose of the brown boy, she added. He did what? said my father. Would the thick brown strap, the sudden red anger, appear again? I cringed. But father laughed. Well, well, well! He laughed again, and squeezed my upper arm. I had pleased him. Oh, Fawfaw, I love you best, but that moment was sweet, sweet. He's a real emery, my father said. A real emery. But don't tell his mother, Halda. She wouldn't understand. It was Fawfaw, I said. The honesty of childhood. Of course it was. My father smiled with pleasure at my robot. He's a better teacher than I imagined. Now I don't feel so bad about leaving again. My mother came in. Leaving again? I said to her. Was I sad, for for? Did I cry? The experiments aren't completed, my mother answered. Your father and I will have to stay at least another six months. Father said, But it's worth it, son. There may be a whole army of Fawfors some day. A whole army? My mother looked frightened. It's dreadful, Richard, dreadful. Laura, metal soldiers, robot killers. My father looked displeased. This is no time for that kind of talk. You knew full well what my assignment was about. I'm not ashamed of it. He looked at me sternly. And don't you be either. Some day you may be carrying on my work. Do you know that? My mother's face went white. 
My robots will do all the world's work, my father said, not just the fighting. But they know a lot about that, too. He turned his eyes on me again, significantly, and he smiled. In the middle of that night, awakening suddenly, hearing an unexpected sound, my mother sobbing, sobbing, my father whispering harshly, so close to red anger, Oh, shut up, Laura, for heaven's sake, shut up! Oh, four, four, quick, tell me a story! The wide lap, the cool chest, the soothing voice. Once upon a time there lived a king and a queen, very peacefully together. Information, registration, consideration, memory. Only a rhyme, but... Sick? Sick? With what? Tell me that, with what? My mother, drawn and pale, the plump hand that we could touch so gently now thin and bony, clutching the sheet. Softly, I don't know, Richard. The doctors should know, Laura. The hospital should know. Do you doubt what they said? No, I don't doubt them. For for, why was I so frightened? They've seen cases like yours before, those army doctors. They have an ugly word for it in the army, Laura. Richard, I'm sorry. Anger, red anger. Would he take the thick brown strap to her? Oh, never, for for, never. Two years of work, two years, and now that pipsqueak Morgan is filling in for me. It's just not fair, don't you see that? And all because you think you're sick. Richard, never mind, never mind. I've stood by your bedside long enough. Hulda can take care of you. You don't need me. You have what you want. You'll be home to smother that boy with sticky love. You'll be happy. But I must get back to work. Why did I cry for for? What frightened me so? Richard, please. What is it? Don't go back. What? Don't go back there. Don't help them make those monsters. My mother, up on her feet, following him to the door. She looked so small. Why, my mother was small. Don't be a fool, Laura. It's a sin to make them, a mortal sin. Getting awfully religious, aren't you? This isn't like you, Laura. Clutching at him, tugging, pulling. Richard, don't go. You're hysterical. Let go of me and get back to bed. That's the only place you feel important, isn't it? I won't let you go. I won't. Tugging, pulling. Oh, for, for, why did I have to watch? Stop it, Laura. Shrieking, crying. Richard, Richard. Oh, for, for, did it really happen? The upraised arm, that hard, flat palm, the sharp, cracking noise. The moan of shock and pain. Oh, for, for, did it really happen? Revenge, for, for. What have they done with him? Dismantled him, fused him, melted him, battered him, crushed him. Has his metal become bullets, gun barrels, bomb shells? Or were the bars on the windows of my room once this strong, cool chest, his sturdy legs, his comforting arms? Oh, for, for, my robot, how I wish you were here! The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. A Kiss for the Conqueror by Clyde Mitchell which is a shared pseudonym originally published in Fantastic February 1957 narrated by Tom Trussell Tonight's the night, Bolgar said 
He ducked his head to catch a glimpse of his face in the particle of mirror hanging on the barrack wall. It was a lean and hungry face, the hollows in the thin cheeks disguised by the three-day growth of stubble. He could see Sergeant Pulley's sneer reflected in the glass. You think I'm joking? Borger pushed the long black hair over his ears with the palms of his hands. There were few combs in the world. I think you're nuts, Pulley said from his bunk. He was wearing a ragged T-shirt, the medal, with its shrieking eagle green with rust, looked ludicrous pinned to his chest. But Pulley wouldn't part with it. We'll see, Bolger said grimly. Can I use your razor? Pulley shrugged. Once more won't matter. I'd give a thousand credits for a straight edge and a strop. Fat chance, Bolger said. He peeled off the coat of his gunmetal grey uniform and flung it on the bed. Then he went to the brown spotted sink and turned the only faucet that worked. The trickle of icy water that emerged ran copper. Iron gun, he said crisply. Pulley extracted the device from his waist and tossed it to his barrack mate. Bulger an account on the water. It was clear. Razor, he said. Pulley threw that too. The metal was rotten green as the man's eternal medal. Bolger looked at it disgustedly, running a thumb along the blade without breaking skin. Couldn't cut lard, he said with a snort. But he started the painful shaving process. Pulley watched in fascination. You really got it bad he said wonderingly, taking a chance like that for one lousy kiss. What's so hot about this dame? I can't explain it. She's a looker. But it's more than that. I've been watching a parade around, swinging a little. He cut himself and swore. I stopped to speak to her once. There was something in her face. The same kind of thing you see in all their faces. "'Yeah,' Pulley said bitterly. "'I know the look.' "'Do you?' the other man turned around. "'What do you see? Hate?' "'Yeah, what else?' "'No.' Bulger shook his head and stared moodily at himself in the silver of glass. "'It's not hate any more, Pulley. "'The hate died out of him a long time ago, right after the war.' right after the contamination. They hate us, Pulley stated flatly. I don't think so. I think it's something different now. Something worse. He began to shave again. Contempt, he said. Pulley's right hand balled into a fist and struck his knee. We should have killed them all. We should have wiped them out. I asked her for a match, Bulger said dreamily. Just a lousy match. She stared at me like I was some kind of microbe. Then she wraps her damn cape around her face like she didn't want to let me breathe on her. His growing anger caused his hand to tremble. He cut himself a second time. So you gonna kiss her? Pulley sneered. Why don't you throttle the gal? Why don't you beat her up? Or haven't you got the guts? Bolger turned the anger on him. Watch yourself, Sergeant. Pulling rank? It was a jeer. Shut up. Pulley swung his boots to the bed. OK, pal, he chuckled. Have it your own way. You're asking for the same amount of trouble. Whether you kiss her or kill her. I'm going to kiss her, Bolger said vacantly, dabbing at his face with a grimy cloth. I'm going to wait for her by the mess hall. She comes out of quarters on Barton Street every night around ten o'clock. She cuts across the square, over to Pitcher Street. It's pretty deserted there that time. I'm going to jump out at... Operation Kiss. Bulgar laughed, toying with the medal on his chest. The last victory of the war. 
Bulgar slipped into his coat. The unbleached cloth was shabby and threadbare, but the buttons were still bright and gleaming. The insignia of the 505th Army caught the light in the room brazenly, the iron hand clutching forked lightning. He had medals, too, and they jangled as he buttoned the coat up to its tight collar. At least, he thought, his medals were worn where they belonged. My, Pulley said mockingly, you look pretty, Lieutenant. Where's my cap? On the hook behind you. Bulgar put the cap on his head, squaring it. He stepped back from the glass to determine its correctness. Beautiful, Pulley said. All right, knock it off. What time is it? Twenty of ten. Better get going. Your girlfriend's waiting. I'm going, Bulgar said, strapping on his watch. He clanked to the doorway of the barrack, but turned before going out. This place stinks, he said. We've got to clean it up one of these days. Sure, Pulley said lazily. He flopped over on the sagging bunk and turned his head to the wall. Have a good time, Lieutenant. His chuckle ended in a yawn. The area was deserted, just as Borga knew it would be. He walked quick march towards the mess hall, hoping that he would be unobserved, regretting now the cluster of medals on his uniform. He knew that these tokens of battle were officially frowned upon, but he also knew that there would be added satisfaction in crushing the hard bits of brass and iron against the girl's heaving chest. He ducked behind a building when he heard footsteps. Two women passed him, speaking in low tones, their skirts rustling in the silence of the night. He held his breath until they were gone, and darted out from concealment, walking more rapidly towards his destination. The mess hall wasn't a hundred yards away from the wire fence that marked the safety limit. Even from where he was, he could see the red-lettered sign that warned conqueror and vanquished alike away from the radiation-contaminated zone. Bulgar suddenly remembered that he had forgotten his iron gun. The thought troubled him only slightly. He had more vital things on his mind. It was an odd revenge he was after. The mess hall was a looming black shadow, facing the rows of sagging roofed shacks that stretched out for a third of a mile. It was their quarters, seedier, uglier, far less equipped to withstand the brutal weather than the barracks, yet somehow warmer, friendlier, happier looking. He hated the sight of them. He dived into the enveloping darkness behind the mess hall, stealing a look at the illuminated dial of his watch. He began his vigil. In a few minutes, she would appear. Time went slowly. Then he saw her. She was giving murmured goodbyes to the people with whom she visited night after night. Now it was time to go, half an hour before the sound of curfew. He saw her arms adjusting her cape over her head in the age-old motion of women. Now she was walking hurriedly away from the shack, across the square, her low heels slipping on the loose gravel. There was a moon, and its light struck her face gently, softly highlighting the sad loveliness of her features. When she was some twenty yards away, Bulgar started after her. He walked lightly, on his toes. She didn't hear him until it was too late. His hand went out, and his fingers whipped the cape from her shoulders to the ground. One arm snaked her waist, the other arched smoothly in front of her. But she was struggling, her foot kicked out forcefully. Just a kiss, baby. He leaned over her, laughing, and replaced the hand over her lips with his own hungry mouth. The kiss was savage, beyond the force of love or sexual appetite. It was a blow, a crushing onslaught, a blitz of the emotions. You animal! she cried. Listen. Help! she screamed. 
No, you don't understand. Stop! she shouted. He turned around, frantic at the sounds that were gathering behind him. He saw the figures coming towards them. When the hands closed around him, he went limp and silent, and allowed himself to be led away. The tribunal took action quickly. The guards, with their rifles firm against their chests, looked at him with neither hate nor animosity. The judges were less dispassionate. Lieutenant Bolgar, he stared over their heads. Janice Damon, the girl stepped forward, still sobbing. Yes, she said, he's the one. He's been watching me, I know it. I've seen him hanging around the quarters. The woman in the silken uniform looked solemn. You were given many privileges, Lieutenant, she said crisply. But it would seem that men, she said the word with loathing, must always take advantage of their privileges. Do you have anything to say? He shook his head. It's greed, you know, the woman said confidentially. The other women of the tribunal nodded in agreement. Greed's the downfall of all men. How many wars do you have to lose before you realize that? He said nothing. Send him to the breeding camp, the woman said carelessly. He'll pay for his kiss. She looked at the girl sympathetically. Your lipstick smudged, dearie. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. Come on, it's just a little click.